everyone. And once again, we sincerely welcome you into the Lord's house this morning. So good to see each and every one of you, and we sincerely welcome you. I appreciate you coming out this morning, and trust that we will again know the Lord's favour and blessing as we worship him together. Psalm 34 says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. O oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. So let's sing our praises to the Lord this morning. And again, we are endeavouring uh, to praise the Lord with everything that is within us while also uh, endeavouring uh, not to sing as loud as we can. We want to sing but uh, try to keep the, the volume down for, for obvious reasons, but let's not let that dampen our enthusiasm for singing our praise to the Lord. Let's stand this morning and sing together. To this point, Father, you have helped us, and for that we are grateful. This morning we give you thanks for all of your blessings throughout another week, and top of our list, Father, is our thankfulness for your love and mercy shown to us in Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace and for dying for us to take away all of our sins and to take the judgment for all of our sins that we might know salvation and deliverance from the judgment that we deserve. And this morning we come with nothing but praise and our souls are praising you and our hearts are praising you and our voices too. You are worthy of this praise, Father, and we give you thanks. We would ask for your continued grace to be upon us through this time together that we might hear from you, that we might know your grace given to each one of us. We ask all of this in Jesus' name and for his praise. Amen. Just a little reminder that, Lord willing, this evening at 6.30 we will have another drive-in service and, Lord willing, uh, Malcolm Barr will be sharing by way of testimony in that meeting 
uh, this evening. So uh, you're all invited. We'd love to see you again here at 6.30 this, this evening for that drive-in. Then our prayer meeting in the midweek at 7.30 on Wednesday evening in the church hall and uh, next Lord's Day at uh, 11.30 here in the church and 6.30 for the drive-in. Scott McFarland will be here preaching. Uh, we're going to be off uh, here for a little while and uh, next week uh, Scott will be ministering the word here morning and evening and know that that will be a, a blessing to you. Uh, just uh, another little thing by way of uh, uh, making, uh, drawing your attention to it, that during the period of lockdown, uh, a little plaque was put up in the entrance uh, to our church hall, and you'll see that, and uh, we'd encourage you even to take a look, and it was put up in memory of our previous pastor, the late Reverend Mander, uh, showing that the hall is dedicated to him. And that it has been put up to show the continued heartfelt appreciation of the entire congregation to Pastor Lander and his family uh, for their years of dedicated service here uh, to us all. And each time you see that little plaque, hopefully it will remind you to give thanks to God for previous blessings that we are still uh, very much reaping the benefit of. I think it's, it's lovely that our first service uh, after lockdown uh, was a prayer meeting. Uh, the verse on the plaque was one of Pastor Mander's favourites, My house shall be called a house of prayer. And so you'll notice that in the hall and it's put up out of loving appreciation in memory of uh, Pastor Mander. We're going to... Uh, uh, go ahead and read from God's Word at this time. And if you have your Bible open, 1 Samuel chapter 18 is where we're turning to, and um, verse number 10. 1 Samuel chapter 18 and verse 10. Also, I want to say that instead of the Holiday Bible Club this year, uh, that we would have loved to have, but on account of uh, all of the changes, uh, we can't have it in its normal uh, format. And so instead of a week of, of nights of, of meetings for the boys and girls, on the 5th of August, which is a Wednesday, there will be different times throughout the day when there will be a short, uh, shorter gathering of children in smaller groups uh, outside if it's a nice day and inside if it's not so nice and uh, because that needs to be very well organized and prepared any children that are coming need to pre-register uh, unfortunately can't just show up unfortunately we can't provide any transportation this year either but uh, we would love for for uh, any of you uh, who are interested to make sure to register for that and to spread the word as well uh, we we've, uh, can have it at different times throughout the day so that no group gets too big, uh, but, but anyone who is planning to come uh, must pre-register. So you can check our website for more information on that, uh, but uh, spread the word for that as well. 1 Samuel chapter 18 and verse 10. And it came to pass on the morrow that the evil spirit from God came upon Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house. And David played with his hand as at other times, and there was a javelin in Saul's hand. And Saul cast the javelin, for he said, I will smite David even to the wall with it. And David avoided out of his presence twice. And Saul was afraid of David, because the Lord was with him and was departed from Saul. Therefore Saul removed him from him and made him his captain over a thousand, and he went out and came in before the people. And David behaved himself wisely in all his ways, and the Lord was with him. Wherefore, when Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, he was afraid of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David, because he went out and came in before them. We'll end our reading at verse 16 with a word of prayer. Dear Father, we thank you again for your word this morning. We believe that you 
personally have inspired this word and therefore it is brimming with wisdom and this morning we come and we want to bow humbly before your word and pray that you will speak to us through this passage this morning. Father, we pray that even as we bow our heads and seek thy grace, that you would give us humility this morning, a genuine God-given desire to hear from you this morning, that we might see your glory and that we might learn how we can live in ways that reflect our gratitude for the gift that you have given to us. And so we commend this time to you in Jesus' name. Amen. There are times uh, you will have experienced yourself when you come to the Bible and it is profoundly encouraging to you. It doesn't matter the depths of discouragement or despair that you're in. When you come to the Word and the Spirit begins to speak, it, it lifts you out of, of that discouragement and that despair and you might start uh, very uh, discouraged but but. By the time you're finished, you are singing. And many of the Psalms follow that exact path. David is afraid, David is in despair, and then he comes to God, and by the end of it, his heart is singing. And that is a beautiful experience uh, that so many have enjoyed. There are other times when you come to the Bible and it's more akin to going to visit the doctor. And the doctor of the word begins to uh, ask you questions and it can begin to get a little uncomfortable as, as he is beginning to diagnose that something isn't right spiritually. And last week, I think it was an incredibly encouraging passage, but this week, this particular text, it's like we're coming to the doctor. Now, don't let that discourage you from listening carefully because when God begins to diagnose, it is never merely to highlight an issue, it is always to give us grace that we might be cured of whatever the issue is. But in this passage, we have the diagnosis of a spiritual disease. If you have your Bible, look at what it says there in verse 6. It says that uh, it came to pass as they came when David was returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women came out of all the cities of Israel singing and dancing, to meet King Saul with tablets, with joy and with instruments of music. And the women answered one another as they pled and said, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. So here we have a response to David's killing of Goliath. And it has to be said that David did not fight Goliath in chapter 17 for personal gain or popularity. David was not wanting the limelight in chapter 17. David was not snatching for position there. His sole motivation was a desire for God's glory, nothing more. He said, I come to thee in the name of the Lord. The Lord deliver thee into mine hand, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. So David is not concerned when he fights Goliath that all the world might know there is a David in Israel. His desire is that all the world might know that there is a God in Israel. So David here is living and moving and breathing for the glory of God. That is his motive. And isn't that exactly how it should be? Whatever we do for the Lord, be it great or be it small, in the eyes of other people, we should be motivated not for a name for ourselves, but for the glory of God. So David is stepping in exactly the right way. In fact, this passage in chapter 18 uh, continues to point out to us how godly David was. In verse 5, it says that David acted wisely. In verse 15, it says that he behaved very wisely. So David is not putting a foot wrong, we might say, in this passage. When we read this passage, we, we are seeing here that, that David is not at fault in anything that he does. That is obvious to us, so obvious that you might wonder, why do you even say that? 
However, what the text does is it shows us what is behind David's behavior. Why is, is, is David acting with such courage and why is he behaving so wisely and how is he living such a godly life? And the answer is because the roots of his friendship are very deep with God. David is in love with God. David desires the glory of God. And, and from the roots of that friendship, David draws courage and he draws wisdom and he draws strength. Three times in this chapter, it tells us this, the Lord was with David. David was walking with God, living for the glory of God, acting righteously, not wanting a name for himself. God was the one who was raising David up to the position of king. God was the one who had given David unusual gifts, whether in music or in poetry. So God is the one who is using David in this passage, and in using David, many, many people are being blessed. And, and David's popularity begins to rise, and David begins to be recognized, and people's appreciation for David begins to grow. David didn't set out for this. David wasn't angling for popularity. He wasn't angling for praise. He was simply walking with God and desiring the glory of God. And as a result of God's hand and favor upon David, God begins to use David to be a blessing to a lot of people. So verse 16 that we read said that all in Israel and Judah loved David. Why did they love David? They recognize God's hand is upon David and, and God is blessing us through the giftedness of David and, and through the anointing that is upon David. And many people are being blessed as they recognize God's hand upon him. So when David is returning from killing Goliath, uh, these ladies are out singing and, and here's what they sing. Saul has slain thousands and David ten thousands. Now this was an honest hearted celebration of what David and Saul were doing. When you and I read this it, it might sound that, that David is being elevated and Saul demoted but the, the people who understand the Hebrew language say that's not the intention here at all. These are the lyrics of a song and, and, and the ladies are celebrating the fact that, that God has given them deliverance from Goliath. They have been on their knees humiliated and, and now when Goliath crashes to the ground, the nation rises to its feet in recognition that the hand of God is upon David. In, in our words, they would be saying here, Saul and David have killed thousands and tens of thousands. Everyone is rejoicing in what God has done through David, the blessing they have received through his life. So everyone is rejoicing. God is using David and they are blessed. God is, 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 is gifting David and they are being blessed and they are rejoicing and celebrating this fact. And everybody is rejoicing. And we can read this and we can say, I understand that. If, if I'd been there and I'd seen Goliath, and realize if, if we lose to this guy, we are all enslaved to the Philistines and, and David wins the victory, we would have been joining in these celebrations. But everybody is rejoicing except Saul. And having shown us David's complete innocence in everything that he did, in fact, the righteousness of everything that David has done, showing that so clearly in this passage, it helps us to see Saul's disease very clearly. What is Saul's problem? Everybody is rejoicing and praising God and singing and dancing and celebrating everybody but Saul. What's his problem? Look at verse 8. Saul was very wroth or very angry and this saying of what they were singing displeased him. Now watch this carefully. Everybody is delighted, smiling, singing and rejoicing. But Saul is displeased. Now God has just delivered them from Goliath. God has, has just used David to be a blessing to them all. And everybody is rejoicing but Saul. Saul is displeased. No smile, no cheers, no encouragement. Why? Well, Saul is displeased that the people 
seem to be praising David more than him. That the people seem to be recognizing David more than they're recognizing him. Saul is displeased with the fact that they seem to be appreciating David or are or speaking more of David than they are of him. He's displeased at this. So Goliath is dead. The nation is free. Everything is going so staggeringly good. God has shouted blessing upon the nation. But Saul's heart has turned sour. In fact, it says that he is angry. It, it means that he's actually hot. Saul is, this has touched a nerve with Saul. This has provoked a reaction in Saul, and he is getting really quite worked up about this. Now, from our vantage point, we're saying, Saul, catch yourself on. Listen, this, the Goliath is dead. God has raised David up. God is blessing David. God is using David. God has anointed David. Celebrate and rejoice and smile and give thanks for the blessings that God is showering upon your nation. But no, Saul is displeased and his heart has turned sour because someone seems to be getting recognized more than he is. Now, there is a biblical word for this disease and it is called envy. In fact, this is a textbook definition of envy that we get here. Saul's heart is displeased by someone else's success. Saul dislikes that someone has more of something than he thinks he has, more possessions or more position or more popularity. Pride wants to be number one and when it feels like it has been demoted to number two, it spawns envy in the human heart. So everybody is rejoicing. God, you have showered our nation with blessing. We were, we, were, we were one loss away from being enslaved to our enemies. And they are rejoicing. But Saul's heart has turned sour. Why? Because God has chosen to use somebody else. And the people are rejoicing and recognizing and honoring someone more than him. Now, we, we all recognize envy, don't we? To say that we don't shows a profound lack of understanding of our own hearts. Has it ever displeased you that someone else was successful? Have you ever felt that your heart would actually be relieved if they were to feel? Or is there someone that if they are given recognition or if they seem to be appreciated more than you are, that your heart get sour, that, that, that you actually get a little worked up as if this has touched a nerve. We've got to examine that when it happens to us to see if underneath it there isn't this disease of envy. Now not only does this passage give us a textbook definition of envy, it gives us its symptoms. I don't know if the other children who are here this morning like sour things or not. My children love sour things, sour gummies, sour anything that you can imagine. And the other day, uh, I bought them something, some of these sour gummies or whatever, whatever they're called, and, and uh, they gave me one and it was so sour, as, as any of you know, when you get something sour in your mouth, your face tells the story. I mean, it's written all over your face. And in the same way that, that when you get something really sour, your face reveals that there's something sour there, in the same way, when there is this envy that is in the heart, it rarely stays there. It, it breaks out in symptoms, and we see the symptoms in this passage. The problem with envy is that it might begin with a dislike for someone else's success, but it turns into a dislike for the other person. So all began here, he heard this, he, he, he disliked that David was being praised and it turned into a dislike for David and a desire to hurt David. Look at verse 10. There was a javelin in Saul's hand and Saul cast the javelin for he said, I will smite David even to the wall. 
Now, this admittedly is an extreme form of envy here to show us the symptom clearly that we might recognize it. And I don't imagine that any of us would dream of picking up a javelin and throwing it at anyone. I hope not. Would we, however, throw a verbal javelin at someone's reputation? James Stocker, a famous Scottish minister, said, a great many of the worst sins of the tongue are the product of envy. He notes that people will say nice things about a person, but all the while it is building up to this inevitable but. Oh, he writes, with how many of these envious buts is conversation garnished. Oh, she's rather good at such and such, isn't she? But. He's really quite good at that, I admit. But. And out comes the verbal javelin thrown to hurt the other person's reputation. Envy dislikes the rise of this other person, so they throw the javelin to make their reputation fall. If we relish throwing verbal javelins at the reputation to other, of others to hurt them, it's envy. There can be good reason for sharing concerns about people but it's not motivated to hurt. Compare this reaction with Jonathan's. Jonathan's love led him to rejoice in David's success. Jonathan's friendship with God went so deep that there was this friendship that grew. And, and he said, David, I want your success and I rejoice in your success as much as I rejoice in my own. Jonathan is saying, I want God's glory full stop. I don't care whose name is attached to it. God can rise and God can lower. God can bless and God can give whatever way he wants. If God is glorified, my heart rejoices. But Saul feels threatened. By David's rise, so he throws the jab. Do you like to throw verbal javelins at other people's reputation? Oh, I'll say this nice thing and this nice thing and this nice thing, but let me get the javelin and let me tell you something that will bring their reputation down in your mind so that I keep my elevated position. It's envy. Not only does Saul throw the javelin, he tries to put David in positions that will get him wounded, but he does something more. Look at verse 19. It says, It came to pass at the time when Mirab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, that she was given to Adriel. You might remember in chapter 17, Saul promised that whoever defeated Goliath would be given his daughter. And now Saul withholds this daughter from David and the public withdrawal of Mirab's hand was surely designed to hurt David. David's success was hurting Saul. His, his heart was sour. It was displeased. And therefore Saul was willing to do whatever it took to withhold from David something that would let it publicly be known. You might all be celebrating, but not me. Now, as with the job, the context here is bizarre. We could think, I, I would never do what Saul is doing here. But, but envy is concerned with the success or the recognition or the appreciation of someone. And therefore, envy is happy to withhold support, to, to withhold encouragement, to, to the, the, the rise of someone else hurts so much that, that they want to be publicly seen to be not supporting. It says even that Saul eyed David differently from that day. In the same way that something sour shows up in your face, David's, Saul's sourness of heart, he, he looked at David differently. He wore his disapproval on his face that others might be smiling, but Saul definitely wasn't. Now, this was not because of principle. This was not a, a, a displeasure at David's rise on a point of principle because there was no point of principle on which to disapprove of this. This was a disapproval motivated by pride. Stalker that I mentioned earlier said, how is it that people can be so petty and so false as Saul was here? The answer is envy. Now, do you recognize any of these symptoms 
And you see how the Bible is being our doctor here? There is this awful disease of envy and here are the symptoms that, that we are displeased, the, 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 that other people are being appreciated or they're being recognized or they're being honored and, and it hurts us. And because we are hurt by it, the instinct is to hurt, whether it be to throw a verbal javelin at their reputation or to withhold our approval when there's no principal point in doing so. It's diagnosing here envy. Envy is the disease. These are the symptoms. What is the cure? Well, first of all, we need to recognize how awful this disease is. I, I told you at the beginning, trips to the doctor's office aren't very pleasant, and, and this isn't very pleasant here, but God never diagnoses anything to, to simply diagnose and say, go with your disease. No, he's always diagnosing it to help us. But first, we have to see how awful this disease is. In Galatians 5.19, Paul lists envy as a work of the flesh. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, adultery, idolatry, witchcraft, envyings, murders. Of the which I tell you, as I have also told you in time past, they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now there is not a heart amongst us that has not experienced envy. Not a single heart amongst us that has not experienced envy. And there's not a heart that is immune from experiencing envy. But, but a heart that is in the constant grip of envy is showing that it has no grasp of grace. A heart that has grasped the grace of God will let go of its envy. And so Paul is saying this is a work of the flesh. Envy's roots are in the flesh and it is to be mortified. Not only is it a work of the flesh, we could say it is a work of the devil. The danger with envy is that we don't end up only dis, dis, being displeased at, at what somebody else is doing, but we are actually being displeased at God's blessings upon them. We might think, oh, oh I'm displeased with them, but, but what we're actually displeased with is that God in his providence has gifted them maybe in a better way than us, or that God is blessing them at this moment, or God is using them. Our complaint with envy is not with them, it is with God. It's not only a work of the flesh, we might say it's a work of the devil, for the devil's hallmark is that he is deeply contorted by his envy of the glory of God. His heart is always scheming and working to how he can hurt what God is doing and envy can lead us to do the same. Not just envious and hurting them, but we're actually envious and hurting what God is doing. Having recognized how awful this disease is, then what is the cure? And the answer, thankfully, is before us in this passage. When Jonathan met David, how did he respond? His heart was pleased. When Saul meets the same David, his heart is displeased. What is the difference? The two of them are set side by side. One of them pleased, one of them displeased. Why the difference? The answer is the roots of Jonathan's friendship with God went deep enough that his heart was satisfied in God. That's it. Jonathan is satisfied in the unfathomable, unmerited grace of God shown to him already. He is awed by the grace of God. His, his heart sings and soars with the grace of God. His cup is so full and running over that he is blessing to give to David. And therefore, no envy of David. Shouldn't we be the same? God gave his only begotten son for you that you might be showered with blessing. Christ has given everything for you that you might be showered with his grace. He left his throne. He lived as a servant. He died as a criminal. Why? To take your sins and your judgment that you might be showered with unfathomable blessing. That you might be adopted into the family of God. Let that sink in. That, that you might be made a joint heir with Jesus Christ. 
that your sins might be entirely forgiven and he goes to prepare a home for you for eternity in heaven. Now here is the question, is that enough for our hearts to be satisfied or are we going to say, no, I'd actually like that to be topped up with more approval and more appreciation than somebody else. Can't you see the absurdity of that? God has given everything for you that, that, that you might know adoption into his family, joint heir with Christ, a home in heaven. He has done all of that. Is that enough for your heart to be satisfied? If you're a Christian, if you're not a Christian here this morning, this is the good news of the gospel. Envy grows naturally in our hearts. It is a sin that needs to be punished by God. And thankfully, the Lord Jesus Christ came and died on the cross that your sins might be forgiven. That, that you, by the free gift of his salvation, with, with no works or effort on your part, might receive this gift, that you could be adopted and become a child of God. And the question is, is that enough? Verse Peter 3, Peter says, Lay aside all malice, guy, hypocrisy, and envy. If so be, ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Jonathan has tasted that the Lord is gracious. He doesn't need the applause of the crowd. What would that add? He doesn't need the throne of Israel. He is known and loved by the king of the universe. He is perfectly satisfied for the king of the universe to open doors and close doors, to raise up and to set down, to give to whoever he wills, use whoever he wills. And if he is glorified, Jonathan says, my heart sings. Here's the question. Is God enough? Or, or does that not quite fill the cup enough? Must we have more appreciation than someone else? Must we have more gratitude from people? Must we have a higher position? And Paul's answer is, come on. This is like somebody giving one child a billion pounds and giving the other child a billion pounds and, and one of them came with a Rice Krispie and the one that didn't get the Rice Krispie is envious. Madness, Paul would say. The heart that has grasped the unfathomable unmerited grace of God in Christ is satisfied and God can do what he pleases with everyone else. Saul on the other hand does not have these deep roots. His heart is a sad empty place. He is the king of Israel. That's not enough. He has had the appreciation of the people. That's not enough. He is the head of their military, can send them where he wants. That's not enough. The people are singing and they put his name first in their song. That's not enough because nothing is ever enough to satisfy the human heart apart from God. His envy is a cry for the world to hear, my heart is not satisfied in God. And the tragedy here is plain to see. Saul is suffering with his envy in this passage. His envy doesn't hurt the purposes of God in David's life one bit. David still becomes king. David still writes psalms that we are rejoicing in thousands of years later. David is still cited as a hero of faith in Hebrews 11. David is described as a man after God's own heart in the New Testament. In other words, all of Saul's envy and his schemes and his plots and his politics, they do not thwart the plan of God in David's life, but they do thwart the purposes of God in his own life. So this passage is being a doctor for us this morning, and it's saying that envy is to be put off. The longer you allow it to grow, the worse it will become and the more harm that it will do to you. So the doctor diagnoses it, gives us the symptoms, but there is a cure and it's found in Jesus. When we recognise envy in our hearts, what should we do? We should always run to the cross and say, God, I want to put this off. This is, this is insane that I would feel displeasure at someone else getting a little bit of recognition, a little bit of 
position, a little bit of honor, whenever you have given me your son. And Jesus, you gave your life and your breath and your blood that I might wear a garment of perfect righteousness, have a, have a home being prepared for me in heaven, and I'm worried about somebody getting an extra rice crispy. That's bizarre, God, and I don't want it, and I confess it, and I pray that you would show me your glory. F.B. Meyer was one of the most well-known preachers there was in his lifetime, pastor in a, in a large church in England, but G. Campbell Morgan was a, another preacher in London at the same time, and apparently maybe Morgan was even a, a, a better preacher, and more people went to hear him, and F.B. Meyer felt this in his heart. And then F.B. Meyer went to, to the, the States to pastor a church, and G. Campbell Morgan came and had a conference near where he was, and Meyer felt this again in his heart. People were going to go and hear G. Campbell Morgan and his church was going to be half empty. And he said, here's what I did. He basically said this. I, I, I go to the cross and I got alone with God and I got to a place where I could say, God, fill those meetings until they are full for your glory. So full that there's not enough space to get them in and they'll come over here and fill my church too. This is what love, the fruit of the Spirit is love, and love envieth not. When we recognize envy, it's not to be tolerated, it is to be crucified at the cross by the grace of God. Let's sing in closing here one more piece, and then we will dismiss with a word of prayer. Let's just sing two verses of this God in heaven hath a treasure riches none may count or tell hath a deep eternal pleasure Christ the son he loveth well let's rise to sing two verses of this lovely hymn <laughs> completely that not only do they satisfy that our cup is full but it runs over as we marvel and stand in awe at your amazing grace that you would love us while we were sinners that you would send your son to bear the wrath that we deserve father we pray that we would taste daily the delightful savor of your grace and our hearts would be so satisfied that father we would rejoice in the rise of others, that we would desire their benefit and their success far more than our own. We pray that you would deliver us from this envy that this passage has mentioned. If there's any here whose hearts are strangers to your grace, that they've never tasted the unrivaled joy of knowing your loving kindness to them, we pray this morning you'd open their eyes 
to see the glory of Christ crucified for their sins and that they might know this joy personally and the roots of their friendship might go very, very deep with you. We pray this in Christ's name and for his praise.